Welcome to our sharing on the second half of St. John's Gospel. We're in chapter 16 and I want to begin with verse 16. Jesus said to his disciples, in a short time you will no longer see me and then a short time later you will see me again. Now if you think of him speaking to them on the night uh, before he died, then it means that uh, in a very short time, he is going to be arrested. He will be three hours in Gethsemane, and then he will be arrested, and most of them won't see him again. Until three days later, he appears to them in the resurrection. So that's the first meaning of what he's saying. But if the meaning of this is that uh, he's talking to the whole church, then the short time is God's kairos time. And it means that Psalm 90 verse 5 says that with the Lord a thousand years is like a single day. Well, Jesus rose from the dead on the morning of the third day. I will come to this in chapter 20, but I, I might as well hint at it here since it is hinted at already. And so uh, Jesus rose from the dead very early on the morning of the third day. If you consider that a thousand years is a single day, then we are living early on the morning of the third day. That is the third millennium. And so the time for his return is very soon on our time clock, not just his. And so that's where you come to this thing that there are different levels in which you can actually uh, understand the text. Before the resurrection, there's absolutely no way the disciples can understand this. So this is verse 17 to 19. Then some of the disciples said to one another, what does he mean? In a short time, you will no longer see me. And then in a short time later, you will see me again because I'm going to the Father. What is this short time? We don't know what he means. You see, that's John's way of getting you and me to look at uh, the, the different ways in which you can interpret this timing of the Lord's return. We don't know what he means. And so verse 19 says that Jesus knew that they wanted to question him. So he said, you are asking one another what I was saying. He's able to read their minds. In a short time, you will no longer see me. And in a short time later, you will see me again. So the disciples are going to have a difficulty even with the resurrection. They're going to have to begin to see Jesus with the eye of the spirit rather than the eye of the flesh. All during the three and a half years of the ministry, they could see Jesus with the eye of the flesh. They could feel him, they could feel his body, okay. But once the resurrection happens, the reality changes. This is what St. Paul said to the early Christians who were battling with this notion. He said, from now onwards, we do not judge anyone by the standards of the flesh. Even if we did know Christ in the flesh, that's not how we know him now. And so for anyone who is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old creation is gone and there's a new one here. It's all God's work. So there's Paul trying to explain that a completely new era has dawned on them. And even if they knew Jesus in the flesh prior to this, that's not the way it is now. So only a small number of witnesses were going to see Jesus in resurrection appearances. And for the rest, it was going to be spiritual seeing. And we're going to have an incident in chapter 20 in which Jesus will say to Thomas, Thomas, blessed are those who have not seen and have believed, which is the, the condition of the whole church apart from the first witnesses. And you have this beautiful testimony of St. Peter in his first letter, uh, chapter 1, verses 8 to 9. And he's congratulating the early Christians and he says to them, you did not see him and yet you love him. And still without seeing him, you are already filled with a joy so glorious that it cannot be uh, described. And it's because you believe. In other words, everything that has been promised in the final discourse, Peter is saying that the people 
in the church have already experienced that, but without seeing Jesus in the flesh. Most of them had not seen Jesus in the flesh. And he said, not only that, but you are sure of the end to which your faith looks forward, which is the salvation of your souls. So seeing Jesus becomes a completely different reality to what it was uh, before the uh, passion and death of Jesus. It's, it's totally different. St. Paul also says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, Now in our lifetime, we only see with a dim reflection, like a dim reflection in a mirror. In other words, our ability to see uh, spiritually uh, and internally is not all that great. But there will come a time when we will see him face to face. The knowledge we have now is imperfect, but one day we will understand everything. And that time is when our eyes are opened uh, in death. So this is Jesus's response in verse 20. I tell you solemnly, you will be weeping and wailing while the world, the unbelieving world, will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. A woman in childbirth suffers because her time has come. But when she's given birth to a child, she forgets the suffering in her joy that a man has been born into the world. So it is with you. You are sad now, but I will see you again and your hearts will be full of joy. And that joy, nobody can take from you. Now, not only John, but the Synoptic Gospels as well, Luke in particular, says that when the apostles saw Jesus on the evening of Easter day, that they were so ecstatic with joy that they were dumbfounded and they couldn't speak and they couldn't say anything. And they just stood there and Jesus had to coax them into conversation with him. So what he, Jesus promised them will actually happen. Okay, but it's, they have to let go of seeing him physically and begin to open up to seeing him in a different way. So the new way of seeing and understanding uh, is going to be given when the Holy Spirit is poured out upon them. And this will enable them to walk with God in the way that Jesus has asked in the uh, final discourse. And so a new level of spirituality will be opened up to them. They will begin to see God and be seen by him, which is normal, he sees everything. They will begin to know God and be known very personally because of a personal relationship by him. They will begin to love God and be loved by him. That's what uh, both Peter and Paul are saying to the early Christians. This is astounding. It is so incredible for us to experience. And it's because of this that their sorrow will be turned into joy when they realize that Jesus is who he said he was, that Jesus sacrifice does what he said it was going to do and that Jesus's victory is what he said it was going to be because after all in the synoptic gospels three times he told them he was going to be persecuted he was going to be uh, crucified and he would rise from the dead so it's in this experience that they begin to know him in a way they've never known him before and so the, the writings of the early church uh, illustrate this very, very clearly about the difference between the way people see and don't see. There's a very telling text in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 to 16, where Paul says that the spiritual one, the one living on the level of above, that is the one who sees and knows and understands. But the unspiritual one, the one who has stayed on the level of below, doesn't understand anything and doesn't see anything. And so it's a very good commentary on John's Gospel, even though it was written uh, years before John's Gospel was written. So you will be weeping and wailing. Uh, the weeping and wailing of the um, disciples during the Passion of Jesus isn't only because of what's happening to Jesus. It's also because of what's happening to themselves. Each one of them has to go through a kind of a passion and death, spiritually, uh, for the old man to die and the new man to be born. 
And so while Jesus is going through this physically and they are going through something on their own level spiritually, but it's the weeping and wailing and also that weeping and wailing involves uh, regret, mourning, repentance for their sins and, and for their failure to stay with Jesus and so on. But they will have their resurrection just as Jesus had his resurrection. And I'll show you when we get to chapter 20 that John gives a lot of attention to the church rising from the dead. Okay. So, so much is going to happen between Friday and Sunday. And this is Thursday night when he's actually talking to them. So it will be like a woman giving birth. And Jesus deliberately uses the image of a woman giving birth. He uses it because this is the language of the prophets. When the prophets wanted to talk about the sufferings and the victory of the Messianic age, they spoke about a woman giving birth. So much so that we have a very telling um, text from Isaiah chapter 26, verses 16 to 19, in which he makes a confession to God on behalf of the whole nation. And he says, Lord, we've had a phantom pre pregnancy. We've only given birth to the wind. So this is, these are his actual words. We have not given salvation to the earth. No inhabitants of the world have been brought to birth. Your dead will come back to life. Your corpses will rise again, wake up and sing, you dwellers in the dust. So the old Israel, because it was on the level of below and it was pre-redemption, it was not capable of giving salvation to the world. That required the God-man to accomplish that. Uh, and so no matter what they tried to do uh, for God, it just didn't uh, produce the divine fruit that was actually required. And so it took the one who was from above, the one who was both divine and human, to accomplish this. And therefore, in accomplishing this, Jesus becomes the source of our joy, our meaning the whole human race. And the source of our joy, Jesus becomes the new Isaac. Now, I'll show you when we come into the Passion that John actually shows you Jesus as the new Isaac. The text here, as I say, is speaking about the Passion and Resurrection at the time of Christ, but it's also indicating uh, something at the end of the world as well. And at the end of the world, in the end times, there will also be weeping and wailing and great distress before the victory, the final victory of Christ. And this is what St. Mark says in chapter 13, verses 19 and 20. So we're now talking about the long distance weeping and wailing. For in those days, that is prior at the time of the Antichrist and prior to the return of Christ, uh, there will be such distress until now has not been equal since the beginning of creation. And it'll never be like that again. And if the Lord hadn't shortened the time, not even the elect would, elect would survive. Now I've given you a kind of a summary of what he said, but it's in Mark chapter 13. So I just want you to see that there's two levels here. One is what is happening at the time of the Passion of Jesus, and the other is the long distance forecast uh, for what will happen prior to the final glorious coming of Jesus. And the uh, prophets spoke about uh, these events as birth pangs. So you can look up uh, Zephaniah uh, chapter 1, verses 14 to 15, and so on. Um, and it's only when the birth pangs at the time of the uh, parousia, the final glorious coming of Jesus, which uh, St. Matthew gives you an entire chapter for, chapter 24, that it's then that Jesus will be revealed as to who he really is in Revelation 19. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So in between the first going of Jesus and the final parousia, his final return, there's a long, long journey for the church to go through the whole night of history. 
and she's embarking on a long journey. And so Jesus now needs to tell the church how she will survive. We've already been told that if you remain in this relationship with the Blessed Trinity, you will survive. But he speaks about it from another angle. From verse 23, he says, I tell you most solemnly, anything you ask for from the Father, he will grant in my name. Until now, you haven't asked anything in my name that's coming out of your relationship with Jesus. Ask and you will receive so that your joy will be complete. So what Jesus is saying is that in the long journey of the church throughout the centuries, she must have a vibrant prayer life. She must be in contact with the Blessed Trinity. She must be in that mutual abiding. And Jesus must be able to reign in the hearts of all believers. And so uh, it is with the resurrection that the disciples are going to uh, really experience the mutual love of the Father and the Son. They're going to discover a union so deep that they realize that they have been loved divinely. They haven't just been loved because God is love. Now, we were told that back in chapter 15, verse uh, 9, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. So the outpouring of the Holy Spirit uh, that comes allows the Blessed Trinity to actually set up their temple in the hearts of all believers. It's not the physical building in the town that is the church, it's the heart of the believers. And we will pray out of this union that we have with the Father and the Son in the Holy Spirit. And that's the prayer that is heard. And that's the prayer that is called in Jesus' name. And as we've said already about this prayer, it's a universal prayer. It involves all of Jesus' children. It is not selfish. It is not small. It is in fact the Our Father. And we're going to see this as soon as we go into chapter 17. So all these privileges that they're going to have uh, will only kick in when the resurrection actually takes place. So let me continue then with what Jesus says. This is verse 25. I have been telling you all this in metaphors, he said, but the hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in metaphors, but tell you about the Father in plain words. That is when they're able to take it. When that day comes, that's when the Holy Spirit comes. You will ask in my name, and I don't say that I shall pray to the Father for you, because the Father loves you for loving me. Now, this is the most divine thing we can experience, that we are loved divinely by the three persons of the Most Holy Trinity. There's no greater privilege or joy uh, that we can possibly have. Jesus says that the Father is going to love you in a very, very special way, just because you love me. I think that's fantastic. There you have the, the family element coming into it. And so the disciples say to him, at long last we understand what you're talking about. I think this is really brilliant. This is the beyond the 11th hour. It's, the, it's one minute to midnight in terms of the passion and death of Jesus. And his, his 12 that he has chosen say to him, Ah, now you're, not, you're speaking plainly and you're not talking in metaphors. Now we understand everything. Now we realize that you came from God. And so they make this wonderful testimony. Yeah, we believe, we believe, we believe. And Jesus said, oh yeah, he knows better. You believe at last. He's just told Peter that that very night he's going to deny him three times. Do you remember that back in chapter 13? You've probably forgotten by now. So much has happened since then. And he said, listen, you're all going to be scattered. They don't realize that the, the prophecy of Zechariah is about to be fulfilled in three hours. That the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will be scattered. And that's it. And he said, you will all be scattered, each going his own way and leaving me alone. But I'm not really alone because the Father is with me. And he said, I've told you all this so you will have peace in me. But believe me, in the unbelieving world, in the cosmos, you will always have trouble. 
but be brave, I have conquered the world. That, that's it, the final words of the, the discourse of Jesus. So what he's doing there is he is actually summarizing things that he has said to them before, except the final thing of you don't really understand because you're going to be scattered in no time at all. Uh, and just as the beloved disciples think that they have got it, they haven't because they're not going to get it. They're not going to understand until after they've had this very, very bitter experience of the passion of Jesus. And even the uh, day of resurrection, which we celebrate as something utterly joyful, to them, it was actually very painful. And it wasn't until the end of the day that they were going to actually even see Jesus. But the last thing he says to them is that in the cosmos, in the unbelieving world, you will have tribulation is the word he says. And uh, this is very important if you study the book of Revelation because the tribulation is described in the book of Revelation and it's not funny. Okay, uh, so the world is going to cause trouble to the church a, because it will oppose the teaching of the church. It will cast God out. It will cast God aside. It will expel Christ from different countries, which is actually happening as we speak. It will persecute the church, and the church is being persecuted in different parts of the world. It will create both saints and martyrs, and it will continue opposing right to the very end until Jesus returns. So that's the end of the final discourse of Jesus. Thank you for listening. Sloan og Hispanic Day Live. Goodbye. God bless you. Maybe getting you can't always this is the death remarkably him. Turn back towards God. Rise up.